First we'll begin with a prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, Lord, and renew the face of the earth. Amen. The readings come from St. Luke. It's St. Luke chapter 6, verse 17. Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from Judea, Jerusalem, and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out of him, and he healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. We live in extraordinary times. I I want to begin by talking about something people have said to me as I became a Catholic, because I, I keep on hearing it and I keep wanting to make the same response, so I'd like to do that now. They said, didn't you realise that when you left Anglicanism and liberal Protestantism, you were jumping out of the uh, frying pan into the fire? And I want to say, but of course I did, because the Catholic Church is struggling in exactly the same way as the other churches and the rest of society. Uh, it was Pope Paul VI who in 1972 said, I think, that the, 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 the smoke of Satan is beginning to fill the church. What's been going on for the last 100, 150 years is going on everywhere. And what's the great surprise is that the church hasn't woken up to the dreadful peril that it's in and to what the issues really are. And I think back to when I was ordained as an Anglican in 1980 and I didn't have a sense of where the traction was going to bite, but my goodness, now I, now we do. So of course within the Catholic Church we're going to find this enormous struggle between the spirit of the age and the Holy Spirit. And in the Beatitudes, Jesus gives some kind of clarity, a greater clarity, as to what's taking place. He starts off by saying, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. I've lost track of the number of times I've read warnings against spiritualizing the poor in the Gospels. But I think spiritualizing the poor is exactly what we do if you've been born again, if you've been born from above, if you understand this this enormous dynamic that is the kingdom of heaven against the kingdom of darkness, against which is the, the heavenly city against the earthly city, as Augustine saw it. So Jesus is not ever saying, blessed are you who don't have enough to eat, enough to pay your bills, blessed are you who have to worry all the time. This would be entirely contradictory. There is no virtue in being economically uh, at the bottom of the heap. Uh, but poor, in the old, in, in the Old Testament sense, always, always has a sense of, of the spiritual hunger, And indeed in Matthew he says blessed, he will say blessed are the poor in spirit. He makes it perfectly clear this is a spiritual dimension that we're talking about. 
So what does it mean to be poor in spirit? What does it mean to be poor in this sense? Because of course St Paul talks in terms of being full of the Spirit and, isn't it, and, and praying in the Spirit. What St Paul wants of, is for us in the sort of charismatic sense to be fully imbued with the Holy Spirit. And indeed we do. How can we square St Paul's fullness of the Spirit with Jesus saying, Blessed you who are poor in the Spirit. I think to be poor in the Spirit is to realise how little of the Holy Spirit we actually have. To realise the gap between who God wants us to be and who we really are. It's not as if St Paul doesn't recognise that in other places. That wonderful passage from Romans 7 where he says, I find that whenever I want to do good, evil is at hand. That the, 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 There are two kinds of me. And the me that longs to do to serve the Lord falls flat on his face. Uh, and the other me uh, is there. Uh, who will deliver me from this body of death? St Paul has a great sense of his poverty of competence, his poverty in spirit in this sense. And Jesus is saying, when you feel this lack between who you are and what you are and what God wants you to be, what he wants to give you, when you feel this lack between the kingdom of heaven and earth, on earth and the kingdom of heaven as it wants to be, every time when you say the Lord's Prayer, you say, Father in heaven, Sanctus, 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 holy are you. And suddenly, like Isaiah, you realise that we are a people of unclean lips. We are poor in the spirit. We, are, we have been corrupted. We uh, are sullied. Uh, and there's this enormous gap between us and the holiness of God. Immaculate us and Immaculate Mary. This great gap. When we say... Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven because we realise how far the earth is away from the will of heaven. With all the anger and the selfishness and the brokenness and the out and out rebellion. This is what it is to be poor in the spirit. To realise that we are surrounded, we are in enemy territory and we ourselves have so little to bring to the table in terms of spiritual strength. Where is our patience? We are poor in patience. Where is our chastity? Oh, as a society, chastity has almost been blown out of the window. Where is our forgiveness? How, how, how rich are we in forgiveness? Not very. We are, we are deeply poor in the gifts and the charisms of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, blessed are you poor. Why? Because this very sense of poverty means we constantly say to the Lord, Lord, I need more of you. There was a wonderful orthodox aphorism that came to me the other day through Facebook where, uh, where the Staretz was saying, of course you've fallen flat on your face. You're running. You're running towards the kingdom of heaven. And when you run with as much energy and enthusiasm as you do, you're bound to trip up and fall flat on your face from time to time. Don't, don't be cross with yourself. Don't be harsh with yourself because you're flat on your face. That's what happens to people who run with such energy and abandon. Of course, you'll be flat on your face, but the Lord will pick you up and save you. Blessed are you who are poor now, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. By asking, by needing, by wanting, by being aware of this enormous gap between us, uh, you will be given the kingdom. Those who ask, receive, says Jesus. Those who knock, have the door opened. So, of course, kingdom will come in response to our asking and our poverty. Blessed are you who are hungry now, you shall be satisfied. There is no virtue into being weak with hunger. There is no virtue in being starving. But St Matthew says, blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Again, this is this great gap between who we are and who God wants us to be. The gap between stuck in our bodies and being children of our Heavenly Father. And so Jesus says, blessed are you if you're hungry. Blessed are you if you've hungered for Jesus in the sacrament. You can have him. There was a time once when I went up to a conference in Spain. And uh, I suddenly, uh, as I entered a square, a village square, where it was, a town square, I felt this deep hunger for the blessed sacrament. And suddenly at that moment, it was midday, and the bells of the several churches in the square rang. And I thought, I wonder if it's at all possible 
but the Lord has given me that hunger because he wants to fill me. And so I went to the nearest church and there mass was beginning. I walked in at the beginning of mass with this profound sense of sacramental hunger. And then I was filled. And we should enter every church when the mass is being celebrated with a profound hunger for Jesus in order to be satisfied, in order that we receive him miraculously in the transubstantiated host. Blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who hunger for Jesus, who hunger for the living God. Blessed are you who weep now. This is really quite harsh. We, I, I was always surprised when this verse was used so carelessly in funeral liturgies because I don't think it's got anything to do with mourning for the death of those we love. It's, it's, it's a terrible misreading of the categories of what Jesus was talking about. It's not as if it is a blessed thing to have your heart broken because the person you love has been taken from you. Jesus was talking about a, a far deeper weeping, a cosmic weeping rather than personal bereavement. Personal bereavement is very difficult. But he's talking about something much worse. He's talking about weeping for our sins, weeping as Our Lady does for the world. One of the very interesting things that's happened recently is a way in which statues all over the world are weeping. Icons are weeping. Our Lady is crying tears because despite the number of times she's intervened in history in the last 100, 200, 300 years, Fatima, Garibondal, Zaitun, Medjugorje, um, and the list, the list goes on and on and on. Rue de Bac in Paris, um, Lourdes. Uh, the church, so far from repenting, has gone the other direction. We'll come to that in a moment. So far from repenting for our sins, this church has begun to call sin not sin. The other day, an archbishop in Luxembourg, I think, stood up and said, we're about to reconsider sexual teaching uh, for the LGBTQ issue. Uh, we've been wrong in the past. This was the most extraordinary thing to say, to deny the moral teaching of the church down the ages for 2000 years. And to say, we are going to reference social sciences uh, and, and other more sophisticated means of knowing the truth without any sense of the drama that would be involved in saying for 2000 years for the reading of the gospel we've been wrong sometime in the early days when we were arguing about about sexual continence and chastity and the whole lgbtq plus agenda people used to say well jesus doesn't say anything about it he's entirely silent so clearly it doesn't mean very much but of course what they failed to understand was the whole drift of the old testament which was about purity it was about purity and about separation, the separation of the holy from the unholy, of the sacred and the secular. And what did Jesus say about this great holiness tradition? He said, not a jot or tittle is going to be taken away from the law. I've come to fulfill the law, not abandon it. But all these people who said Jesus was silent about sexuality and sexual ethics in the New Testament had no understanding of the teaching of the old and that Jesus had come to complete it, to reinforce it, to deepen it. My goodness, he makes it harder at times. Whereas divorce was possible uh, in, under Moses, Jesus tightens it up and says, but listen, look at God's intention. When there, was sin, when, when there was the sin of adultery, Jesus said, I'm not going to let you get away just with the action. I'm going to call you up for what you do in your imagination and your heart. He didn't make it easier, he made it harder. He made it more focused. He made it more real. The idea that somehow if Jesus says nothing about sexuality, he's abandoning the whole of the thrust of the holiness tradition that had been that the, the children of Israel have been trained in for a thousand years is the most dreadful spiritual illiteracy. What is happening in the church when an archbishop and the cardinal says, I'm going to deny that the, the, the ethical teaching of the church uh, down the ages. Did you know that a, that a group of Ukrainian bishops wrote to him and they wrote to the German, sorry, they wrote to, they wrote to him but also to the German bishop saying please don't go any further down this road of laxity. 
we're having the greatest difficulty in preaching chastity in, in, the, in the Byzantine, in the uh, Eastern Rite in the Ukraine. Because the moment you accept this new teaching that if you're in love, you can live together uh, in, in, in full intimacy, why is there any, where is there any space at all for straight people to be chaste before marriage? Where is there any, any space at all, any requirement for gay people or bisexual people to be chaste if they're not married? Chastity simply disappears. How is it possible that one could have a church that began to preach that chastity was not required when we know of the close link between chastity and holiness? The smoke of Satan is filling the church, said Pope Paul VI. And indeed it is. Of course we are jumping out of the pan into the frying pan. The, smoke, the fires of hell burn throughout our culture and even throughout the church. Blessed are you who weep now, says Jesus. We must weep for the sin of the church. Weep for the false teaching. Weep for the misleading of the sheep. Weep for confusing good for evil. But Jesus says don't give up hope if you weep. If you weep over sin, over our own sin, and over the crisis in the church, where evil is being exchanged for good, holiness is being exchanged for sin, then, says Jesus, you shall laugh in heaven. But a precondition is getting the diagnosis right now. And then, says Jesus, blessed are you when you are cancelled. We should have expected cancel culture. Of course, cancel culture has come up time and time again, as those who pursued holiness and truth have been persecuted by the surrounding culture. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. How many Christians today, as they stand up for Jesus, as they embrace the teaching of our Lord, on sex, on sexual identity, on gender ethics. How many of them are being reviled, losing their job and having hate campaigns unleashed against them? We will be hated if we stand up against evil. It's extraordinary the way in which secular society uh, accuses Christians and those who seek to hold on to the beauty of sexual ethics as being hate filled because of course the thing is completely reverse they are hating us because we're telling them the truth and the truth would constrain them the truth would hold them and change them the truth would actually set them free but they don't want to be set free and so instead they repulse us they uh, castigate us and criticize us for telling them the truth rejoice Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great as in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, you will have your consolation. And again, this is nothing to do with economics, although very often, uh, there is a connection between satiated economically and satiated spiritually. Jesus warns those who are self-satisfied and self-sufficient that it's very difficult to get into the kingdom of heaven. There is perhaps more of a link between the rich in wealth and the rich in spirit than the poor in wealth and the poor in spirit. But here Jesus says, woe to you who are rich. Our whole culture has been fixated on self-satisfaction. This Jungian individuation that has permeated uh, what we've been doing in the last 50 years, this call to fulfill our potential. Teachers have been uh, enthused about the potential of all of their students without the recognition that not all students, not all children are going to be Einstein or Mozart uh, or uh, or, or the, a great actor or pop star. But this call, which takes its, finds its roots psychologically in Carl Gustav Jung and individuation, this is one of the arguments I'd like to have, discussions I'd like to have with Jordan Peterson. 
this preoccupation with the false promise of human potential and the promise that we can only be happy if somehow we have enriched ourselves in, our, in the fullness of, of who we ought to be and become. Uh, and the problem here is, of course, that, that, that satiation is bad for us. We cannot be rich in terms of sexual experience. We can't be rich in terms of romantic love. We can't be rich in terms of quality of relationships because none of these things uh, are, have anything to do with the kingdom of heaven. They've got to do with self-satisfaction. We have to learn to feed the soul when we're not given the romantic bliss we long for. When, we're not, when, when, when sexual expression doesn't deliver. But the extraordinary thing is the way in which having become such a sexually literate and profligate society, um, people are deeply unhappy sexually. Uh, we look into the newspapers and you see all the ways in which men fail to satisfy women and all the ways in which women complain that men uh, that, that um, women satisfy men. There's a great disconnect between the sexes and yet n there is never any thought that perhaps this hypersexualization, this promise that you could be happy if you get enough sex is, is false and untrue and that actually sex is immensely difficult, quite problematic, doesn't usually deliver what it promises and anyway when you've been with the same person for five years, ten years, fifteen years, twenty years, thirty years, it begins to change. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's no honesty that, that, that we are much less sexually competent than uh, society suggests we ought to be and that sexual competence of literary changes as a relationship grows older and we move from from the animal to the angel. There's no sense of reality at all in our society uh, that the richness that we're promised is actually uh, an illusion. Woe to you who are rich. You've received your consolation and it wasn't very much at the time. Woe to you who are full now for you shall be hungry. Jesus says again, he warns us that if we satisfy ourselves in the terms that the world promises us that will make us happy, then we shall in fact be deeply disappointed. And isn't this what the devil attempts, tempts Jesus with at the beginning of his ministry when Jesus confronts him? The devil says, renounce who you are and I will give you all these kingdoms. I will make you happy politically and in terms of the way in which the earth is. And Jesus repudiates the devil. But the church isn't, has, has forgotten to repudiate the devil. The church has forgotten to say to people, you must learn to fast and weep and not seek satisfaction, either sexual or romantic or even psychological, because it is God who is your bride. It is the Holy Spirit who is, who is your intimate one. Uh, and that is where you will find lasting joy and lasting peace. Woe to you who laugh now, you shall mourn and weep. This has nothing to do with having a sense of humour, nothing to do with joy. Jesus doesn't say woe to you who are full of joy, for the Holy Spirit brings joy. In fact, one of the gifts of the Spirit sometimes can be extraordinary, unrestrained laughter, the most deep and wonderful joy that rolls down from heaven into our hearts and resonates enormously, incapacitating us with laughter and joy. Now, Jesus is talking about a different kind of laughter. He's talking about, again, self-satisfaction. He's talking about uh, uh, about a sort of a, a joy that stems that, that flows entirely from a quality of satiated living. That he says that satiation is going to leave us ultimately empty inside. How is the church going to learn to confront our satiated culture with great difficulty? So we need to listen to the voices in the church who are calling us to weep and to mourn for what's gone wrong. We need to listen to the voices who are calling us to gain a sense of discernment uh, in terms of the difference between good and evil. There is a great fog, a great smoke in the church today and we will find this struggle to discern good from evil 
joy from fake laughter, spiritual fullness from secular fullness. We'll find this, this discernment is going to be too much for many people. But this is where the renewal of the church lies. But as we speak out, the truth about our repudiating false satiety, um, false self-indulgence, false self-satisfaction. So those who've been pushing it as a human right, as an absolute necessity, will attack us and try to silence us for speaking the truth. For they don't want to be set free. They prefer the, the, the web of deception that has been spun around them. In the end, our Lord gives us freedom. There is no point that is too late for repenting. It's that wonderful phrase, that lovely, marvellous poem about a horse rider who was thrown from his horse. And as he began the descent to the ground to break his neck and die, he realised he was not right with God. And it said, between the stirrup and the ground, he mercy sought and mercy found. But let's not leave it until the split second before our mortal accident. Let's begin the process of purification with as much energy, as much devotion, as much hunger, as much need as, as we can muster, so that the Holy Spirit finds a space in us to cooperate with our will. And we find ourselves joined with the divine will. And the work of God begins now in us. And this great tidal wave of evil that is in which so many people are drowning gets repulsed by the wave of the Holy Spirit, a wave of holiness, a wave of love, a wave of forgiveness that carries the people of God to heaven. To God be the glory now and unto the ages of ages. Amen.